Good afternoon, everyone. Everybody's awake now. <laughs> Welcome to the McLean County Museum of History, where our mission is to preserve, educate, and collaborate in telling the diverse stories of the people of McLean County. This program is being live streamed. We want to give a special thanks to our live stream sponsor, WGLT, Bloomington Normals Public Media, part of the NPR network. Today, I am excited to bring you this program, this Lunch and Learn Game Development with Ben Rossett and Jamie Mappy. I'm gonna keep my comments short because I'm really excited. I really am. Ben is a longtime board gamer and an award-winning board game designer. He's been designing games since 2009 he was the co-founder of Washington Tabletop Convention in Washington, D.C., and is the director of HR at Panda Game Manufacturing. He loves animals, tea, dark chocolate, <laughs> history, Seinfeld, Dave Matthews Band, that's what I'm talking about, and the Big Lebowski. He lives in Bloomington and is a volunteer at our very own McLean County Museum of History, and we thank you for that. And we also have with us today, Jamie Mappy, another good friend of ours. Jamie founded and owns Red Raccoon Games, one of Illinois' largest game stores. His mother gave him a Dungeons and Dragons box set for Christmas when he was seven, putting him on a map of geekiness. Let me say that right, geekiness. That has never ended. He says he was geeky before geek was even cool. So again, I'm not going to keep you. I'm going to turn it over to these folks. And uh, please help me give a warm welcome to Jamie and Ben. And we'll let the games begin. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm going to start a timer to try to keep myself on pace here. So we'll see how we do. Okay, um, so we're going to start off with just a little bit of history. We thought we would want to kind of do some history of board gaming and how we got to now. And then, so I'm going to do that part, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ben, and Ben's going to take more of the game development part since he does that and I don't, so that makes more sense. So uh, first slide here. Hey, look, it's Ben. Ben, do you want to talk about Ben? Uh, sure, Jeff, thanks for that introduction. I think Jeff covered basically all of it. Whoops, feedback, it's okay. Um, so I'm from the Chicago suburbs. I've lived in Bloomington a couple of years. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, uh, I've been a gamer my whole life. Uh, I remember playing games, dice games, card games, Boggle, Scrabble, uh, Yahtzee, things like that with my grandma when I was like five years old, right? That's like kind of how I got into games. Uh, and I've always enjoyed them growing up ever since and have been designing them since 2009. And now I get to work in the industry full time, both as a designer and also uh, for a company called Panda Game Manufacturing, who actually makes and manufactures board games, like the one that I brought to, uh, to share with you a little bit later today. Um, yeah, and uh, it's gaming all the time for me. I'll turn it over to Jamie. Uh, so I'm Jamie Matthews. I'm originally from Chavance, Illinois, which probably none of you have ever heard of. It's a, one of the multitude of tiny farm towns in Illinois. Um, small business owner, my wife and I had Kelly's Bakery and Cafe and the Media Technology Group. We sold those ones and we now have Red Raccoon Games and Decorated Grocery. Um, I do a lot of volunteer stuff um, around the community. Um, I've done a lot of stuff here. I did a lot of the wiring and a lot of the wireless stuff back in the day here at the museum as well. And like Jeff said, uh, I'm a geek. So, um, you know, I, I like to say I have one picture that sums up most of my life. Um, well, that didn't go as planned. So, you know, you just take life as it comes at you and you roll with it as it goes along. I didn't mean to open a game store. That was never in the plan. It, but I, I walked into um, the game store that we had in downtown. Time. It was named Grafalia's Theory, 
which is the worst marketing name ever. Because <laughs> nobody can pronounce it right, and if you could pronounce it, you sure could spell it. If you can't spell it, how are you gonna find the website or the Facebook page or anything like that, right? Um, and uh, I was trying to get the owner to do more marketing and more outreach to let people know that he existed in the community because he'd been in downtown for nine years and nobody knew he was even there. And so finally one day he got mad at me. He said, why don't you just buy this damn thing and do it yourself? And I did. So that's how we got here today. today. Um, and so now the, the store has existed in downtown Bloomington now for 16 years. And most people, we're, it makes me feel really good about my marketing budget that most people still say, oh, you guys are new? Yeah, new yeah. for the last 16 years. So, you know, but we're, we're, we're growing. We're doing awesome things. So um, we thought we'd start this off talking about a history, a little bit of history of board games since we're in the museum. And so we were gonna, I found a list of the eight oldest board games that humans have been playing. And a lot of people think that chess is the oldest game. And chess is actually number eight on the list, right? So the writing is a little bit hard to find, see on here. I've played all the games except for this, the number seven game, which is Nine Men's Morris. And that was one I'm like, I haven't even heard of that game before. Go is, of course, famous as there are more possible moves and combinations in Go than there are stars in the sky. Um, Royal Game of Ur, for the longest time, we thought that was the oldest one because it was found in some ruins in Mesopotamia. But actually it turns out that Senet was found in um, Iran, which is the ruins of the old uh, Assyrian civilization, um, and they carbon dated it at 3500 BC. So that game is 5500 years old at this point. Uh, um, Backgammon, of course, is classic, and Checkers has been around for forever as well. Um, my wife and I were lucky enough to go to uh, Hawaii a couple years ago, and there's an abandoned village on the big island, and in the center of that village there was a big carved stone, and that stone is actually a game board carved into the stone. It's just been there for nobody knows how long it's actually been there. So that was pretty cool too. Um, dice are of course popular, and dice have been almost around almost as long as board games have. The oldest set was found, you know, the oldest set of dice that we've identified so far is 5,000 years old. And I got a couple of pictures. The top picture over there is terracotta dice that they think are about 3,700 years old. And then um, metal dice uh, that, were, that came out of a Roman um, site. And uh, they think that those ones are about 3,500 years old. So dice have been around for forever as well. Dice have been recovered out of the pyramids and uh, some of the tombs in Egyptian as it went along. So people have been playing games as long as we've been speaking to each other, basically. Um, bringing things a little bit forward to games that you have actually heard of, thinking about kind of the more modern type of games. I was surprised, I didn't realize that the game of life actually was created in 1860. So Abraham Lincoln could have been playing life, right? Um, sorry, Monopoly, Shoots and Ladders, Scrabble, Candyland. These are the games that I grew up with, probably a lot of you grew up with as well. They've been classic games. You know, we had companies like um, Hasbro and Mattel and Parker Brothers and, and um, the only one, all, all these game companies that made all these, the only ones that still exist are Hasbro and Mattel. And neither of them is doing super great right now either. Um, I didn't realize that Trivial Pursuit was as old as it was either from 1979. I thought that was actually a 1980s, late 80s game. That's what I remember it from, so a lot older than that too. So this is kind of the games that we grew up with, but what we're gonna to talk to you about more today are kind of modern games, right? What we call the modern age of gaming. And it started with Avalon Hill in the late 70s and going into the 80s. And Avalon Hill made a ton of war games. That's what they were really famous for. With games where you were simulating a lot of the battles, like the Battle of Guadalcanal and or the Civil War and all these different battles over time. And it was a ton of teeny tiny little cardboard pieces that people would push around the board. We still do a little bit of that, but not, you don't see hundreds of, of, of cardboard chips that you're moving around the board anymore. Um, Avalon Hill, of course, had some other games, you know, like there's still a few of them that still exist today, like Betrayal of House on the Hill is probably their most famous game. Um, but uh, they were really known for war games. Right behind them was Game Designers Workshop, and we wanted to talk to them because they were here. They were, they were incorporated, there's a bunch of college kids who went to ISU who 
actually incorporated their company in 1973 in normal. The reason why I put Bloomington Normal on there is there's still people who like to argue about it because the, it was incorporated in normal, but supposedly a lot of the game testing happened in the basements of houses in Bloomington. So, um, so people like to argue with it, so I just put Bloomington Normal. It seemed easier to solve that argument right there. And again, some of their um, games still exist um, as well that are, you know, Traveler it was one of the first science fiction role-playing games. It was after Dungeons and Dragons, but now we went to space instead of living with swords and sorcery in King Arthur time. And um, Traveler still exists. We have it on the shelf of Red Raccoon right now. Twilight 2000, it was kind of a, a very dark look at um, politics, where politics could go to. It imagined that World War III had actually happened, right? When, and it was created during the Cold War. So um, that one still exists. There's a new form of that that just got reprinted just a couple of years ago as well. Harpoon was famous for, it was a submarine game. It was one of the most accurate depictions of submarine battle that had ever been created. To the point where Harpoon was actually using Naval Training Academies to teach the up and coming sailors on this kind of this bigger picture of how to actually, how submarine battles really worked as well. Um, and ironically, Ben and I met yesterday to kind of go through and make sure we knew what we were going to talk about. And then yesterday afternoon, Mark Miller, who was one of the founders of Game Designers Workshop, came into the store just to talk about you know, some of his stuff that he's working on specifically. We are talking about traveler stuff. So that's kind of cool, right? He's kind of, he's kind of famous that you, you know, a lot of you might not know of him, but in our world, he's kind of famous as a designer because of, they put out 100 games. I think it was like 133 games or something from um, 73 until 1996. And they were all over the place. Some of them were war games, and some of them were um, just fantasy games of all sorts and types as well. And um, like I said, Traveler is still around today as one of the most um, in-depth science fiction. We're out in space and, and exploring and working. Maybe you run into aliens, maybe not, while you're in space too. So still famous for that as well. Um, Central Illinois is also home of, there's a lot of designers that um, make Central Illinois their home as well. So we've had a lot of designers that have come up over time as well. Ben, Gage, Michael, I just listed a bunch of people I knew. We actually have uh, uh, somebody who works on games in the house that we, Ben said, hey, we should put on the list, but we forgot. So um, I'm just dropping that. Jovian. Jovial? Jovial. Jovial, yes. Jovial right. So uh, Jovial Games as well. So we have a lot of different game companies that are in and around Central Illinois. And people ask me why there's so many. I'm like, what else are you going to do in the middle of the winter? I mean, it's not like we're going to go out riding snowmobiles. We're not going skiing. We're not, you know, or, or in the middle of the summer when it's too hot, right? We go from it's too cold to go outside to it's too hot to go outside. You know, we get our six weeks of being outside per year. So um, I, one of the things I wanted to point out, too, is there are two different groups of game designer groups, and Ben is involved in both of them, um, one in Bloomington and one in Peoria, where it's groups of people who get together to help each other build games. And, and Ben will talk more about that as well, but I just always thought it was cool that these groups get together to say, hey, I have this idea, can you vet this idea, tell me if it's any good or not, and provide feedback as we go along. And uh, at Red Raccoon, we make a point of we try to carry as many locally designed games as we possibly can. So, um, this is one of the things I want to. So, <laughs> I, I love the name of Meritrash. Um, so, a lot of the games that we, we talk about nowadays are, are, are considered what they call Euro games. And this big board game revolution came out of Germany starting in the late 80s, early 90s with. Um, this idea that, you know, as a kid, right, you grow up in Monopoly, and the whole goal of Monopoly is to put everybody else out of the game and be the last one standing. Risk, put everybody else out of the game, be the last one standing. Um, clue, beat everybody else. So there's all, American games are defined by there's always a lot of conflict in there. And Euro games are kind of often defined by the fact that everybody is in the game generating as many points as possible, and at the end of the game, everybody's still in the game, it would just see who had the highest score, right? So it's a little less direct uh, competition. Ben had heard a story and um, about why this was and why these types of games were coming out of Germany that I had never heard before. Do you want to talk about that real quick? 
Sure. Um, I, I won't claim that this is 100% accurate, but after World War II, there was, in Germany, there was a lot of resistance to toys and games that were about war and that were about violence uh, and that were about killing. And a lot of games had been about that up till that point. Uh, and so designers in Germany specifically started looking for other topics to make games about that weren't about war. And they started making games about um, building cities and um, it, you know uh, traveling and exploring and other kind of topics that were not were not as violent and so um, that culture has just been there right um, since after World War II uh, and that's why a lot of these Euro games that they're now called originated in Europe and then spread to France and other places. And the reason why American game, games kind of got this nickname of Ameritrash is that if you think about how many licensed products that we have where a new movie's coming out and we've got to have Happy Mill toys and we've got to have a whole range of toys and board games and rethemed skins on games. So it's, it's Monopoly, but it's now Dexter Monopoly or it's Dungeons and Dragons Monopoly or whatever. That's where the name Ameritrash came from is our habit of just taking whatever intellectual property we can get our hands on and slamming it onto a game, not really caring if the game was any good, just did it sell some copies because it was tied to that movie, that, that TV show, that, that music artist that just came out. Um, that's not necessarily 100% true anymore. I think that, that tendency is dwindling in a lot of places, at least in the board game section. Sure, still out there for toys, but that's where the name came from. Um, the other thing is, that symbolizes the difference between them is how it is luck used. Right? A, a lot of times in Euro games, if you're rolling dice or drawing cards, you do that, then you get to make your decision based on that information. Versus in a lot of times in the Ameritrash games, you make a decision, then you roll the dice and see what happens. So you have no ability to affect the luck after that part of it, right? So where the luck is introduced into the game can make a big difference as well. Um, Catan, the board game formerly known as Settlers of Catan, was probably the first massive introduction into the American market that really kind of signified this change. It was created in Germany, and the last number I had heard is it sold over 20 million copies. Catan is to the point where, uh, of cultural significance in board games where there was a story that came out a few years ago, the Packers were in the playoffs, and some of the young guys were going out and getting rowdy at night, and so the coaches put a curfew on them that they all had to be in the hotel by 7 p.m. And one of the guys brought Catan, and now all the Packers play Catan, and they get super competitive playing Catan. Um, and uh, my friend Pat owns the board game store in Green Bay, and he's like, you know, he said he's got this whole store full of kind of these, you know, nerdy guys in there, and all of a sudden, a six foot six, three hundred and seventy-five pound like wall of muscle walks in the store to get a copy of Catan. Um, I also love the the stack that the, the older players make the rookies on the teams responsible for bringing the games when they're on the road because they actually take Catan with them when they travel now. So. Um, and, and Catan set the stage for a ton of games that are coming out now, too, because we have approximately 3,000 games coming out per year now. It's ridiculous. A large part of what we do at the store is try to sort through the games to say, is this worth having or not? Because sometimes people are just throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. Um, I'm not going to read all these off there. The mechanics behind board games have changed significantly. It got far more advanced as well. It's no longer roll some dice and move your piece around the board, right? We, some of those games are still out there, but that you don't see that very often anymore. Social deduction is probably one of the most popular categories in the store, which is I get a card, I know who I am, but I don't know who Ben is. And part of what I have to figure out is figure out is, is Ben on my team or is he on the other team, right? And, do I need to partner up with Ben or eliminate Ben? And there's a ton of variants on there, but they're great casual party games and people love them. And over here on the right hand side over there is Roll and Write. And the category of Roll and Write has hugely expanded as well. You know, in a Roll and Write game, you often don't get a game board. You get a sheet of paper with some markers on there. And as we either roll the dice or flip some cards over, you have to fill in your board uh, as, as uh, the best you can. We do game training at the store, and we played a game the other day called Next Station London. 
so it was up for a bunch of awards, and you're basically trying to optimize the subway system of underneath of London to the best of your ability. Everybody gets the exact same information, but how they choose to put it onto their board makes the entirely completely different as you go along. Um, a large part of the success of board games is the rise of geek culture, right? Because like I said, I was geeky before geeky was cool. I'm not sure it's cool now, but I don't care. I'm going to say it's cool now. Because what happened is all the people who were creating popular media in Hollywood are my age, and they're making movies and TV shows out of all the nerdy things that I loved to do when I was a kid, right? Um, so Lord of the Rings kind of probably started at Stranger Things and Critical Role, Big Bang. I mean, so many things. Everything coming out of Hollywood feels like it's part of geek culture. Um, which has also led to the rise of conventions as well. So FlatCon um, is one of our local ones, and Heroicon's in Decatur, FlatCon's here in Bloomington, GameholeCon's in Madison, Geekway of the West is in St. Louis. So these are small ones, under 1,000 people. These are kind of medium ones where like 15, 20,000 people show up, and then Gen Con, I think, sold out at 72,000 last year. And that doesn't even include San Diego Comic Con, which I think was 125,000, something crazy like that. Part of what is driving all this stuff too is crowdfunding, which is um, the old days you used to have to create a game and then you had to find a publisher who had submitted like a manuscript and you would hope somebody played your game and maybe they picked your game up and maybe they didn't. Crowdfunding allows you to go straight to people and say, I have this idea and if you give me some money, I will promise to make this idea into a game and then later you can send me, I'll send you a copy of it once I get it produced, but I don't have the money to produce it up front. Crowdfunding has opened the door to a ton of people making games who probably never would have got their start, with I think probably one of the most famous examples being the game Wingspan. It's literally all about birds. Even the Audubon Society picked it up, and I think they've sold five million copies of it. And Jamie Stegmaier is uh, in St. Louis, and he probably never would have gotten his start without being able to crowdfund the first one. So, hey, it's your turn, man. So that's the path, the history. Now, here's how it actually happened. Do you want your, uh, you, want, you want to flip it or you want to flip it? I'll, I'll come over and flip it. Okay, thanks. We'll switch, we'll switch that. Figure out how to use this. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so Jamie uh, kind of gave us a, a broad kind of, you know, thousand foot view of the history of board games and then zooming in to, um, yeah, a little bit here in Bloomington Normal and what's happening. Um, and I'm gonna drill down and take us further and talk about the actual design and creation of games. Um, and I'm gonna use one of my games, First in Flight. I chose it as the example because it's about history and about the Wright brothers. Um, and I'm gonna kinda use this as an example uh, talking about how a game goes from an idea in a designer's head to actually a product that you can walk into a game store like Red Raccoon and buy and bring home and put on your table and play. All right, so I'll just set this here. Okay, so what is a board game designer? Well, there's a couple different ways I like to think about it, a couple different uh, definitions I like to give it. First, uh, it's a person who conceives of tabletop play experiences. And so when I'm designing a board game, I'm thinking about the rules to the game, I'm thinking about how the game actually plays, the interactions that players are having on the table, what kind of pieces you're gonna need to play that game, uh, and, um, and I'm putting that experience together with basically a set of rules of how you engage with this thing in order to hopefully bring fun out of it. Uh, and so that can include board games, card games, dice games, miniature games, role-playing games, basically anything that you play on a tabletop, usually without the use of any electronics, um, you know, or screen. Um, another uh, definition that I like for board game designer is a person who blends art and science. And so for me, this is one of the reasons that I love designing games is it engages both halves of my brain, right? Right brain, left brain. Um, it's half a science, right? Balancing the game, making sure that the rules work correctly, that there's no dominant strategy or the game's not broken because there's a way to automatically win if you make a certain move. So that's kind of the science of putting together the pieces to the game so that a fun experience will come out. 
And then the art is the creativity part of it, right? I get to create whatever theme I want, whatever I want this game to be about. And at some level, it really is like a work of art. As an artist, I can take it in what direction I want and then apply that kind of mathematical uh, underpinning to it, which is the science part, uh, to make it work and to make the whole thing come together. Another way to design, uh, to define what is a board game designer is a person who tells stories. And I think that there's different stories you can tell through board games. Um, I kind of break them into two big categories. One is what I call world building. So if somebody creates a game about um, you are a, uh, uh, after the, uh, uh, the zombie apocalypse comes and you and the last humans that are uh, still alive are going out to fight the zombies, right? This is world building. This is an example of a fictionalized set of events or situation that is the premise and base for playing a game. And that's one way to tell a story through a game. Another way to tell a story through the game uh, is uh, something like First in Flight, uh, which is m systems modeling. So modeling something that is an actual historical event that really happened or something that is a current event that is happening right now. And you can tell a story through board game form the same way that you, uh, in a similar way that you can tell a story through a novel or tell a story through um, a nonfiction book that describes something that happened in history, right? Board games is just another media to tell stories, either fictionalized or nonfiction. Okay, so the design process. So how uh, do I actually design a game? Um, well, it's basically uh, three steps that kind of go in an iterative loop, right? So first I'll have an idea like, hey, the Wright brothers were pretty cool. That would be fun to make a game about the invention of the airplane and powered flight. Okay, so I have an idea. Now where do I go from there? Well, now I need to prototype it. So I need to say, well, what pieces are we gonna need to play this game? What are some of the basic rules that we're gonna play, use to play this game? What are some of the mechanics that Jamie was talking about before that we're gonna use in this game to tell this story? Uh, and I will gather the pieces that I need uh, print it out on my home printer um, and just set it up on my uh, dining room table and invite some friends over and try to play the game and see if it's fun. Uh, and that is the play testing part of it, right? So um, testing the game, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. And then from there, it's just an iterative loop. So after the play testing, I've got a whole list of things that didn't work, that weren't fun. And so I think of ideas, again, back to the idea of what changes can I make to improve the play of the game, go back to the prototyping, print out the new pieces that I need, go back to the play test, play test the new version, go back to idea, and just continue to iterate like this until when? Until I say it's done because I'm the artist and I get to decide when the piece of art is done. But also a couple of other things. How do I know when a game is done when it's ready? Um, I like to say when my play testers start asking me questions like, when will this be out? When can I buy this, right? When people start offering me money for my copy of the prototype that they just played at the table, I know that I've got something special and that this is ready to become a real game that is sold in a store. Okay, so just a couple pictures of prototyping. This is just, um, you know, games that I've developed over the years. Um, just print it out on my home printer, right? I don't need any special equipment to make a, make a prototype. Um, I just uh, put the files together with some kind of basic graphics program. Uh, and then print stuff out and go collect pieces. When I started designing games, I used to take pieces from other board games I had in my collection that I wasn't playing, which I quickly found was a very bad idea because then I had a bunch of unplayable games sitting on my shelf because half the pieces were missing. Uh, so now I kind of buy uh, some bits and components and uh, teacher resource websites are really good for that, getting little bits that you can use to kind of uh, use as board game bits. Um, and just put stuff together from what I can, you know, print out at home, right? Nothing super fancy. And, all right, so 
Now we've got the idea. We've got this game that's been play tested, right? Um, people are telling me that it's good and they want to know when it's coming out. And so now it needs to get turned into a real product that can get purchased in a store. So how does that happen? Well, the design that I do is just the beginning. After that, I will, I don't self-publish my game, so I don't go on to Kickstarter to try to raise money. I don't, I'm not the one actually putting the game out on the market. I'm licensing my games to publishers that are doing that, right? Similar to if you were to write a novel, you might want to find a big publishing house to actually publish your novel for you. Same kind of situation. So I hand over basically a set of rules to the game and maybe my homemade prototype that I printed out at home. And the publisher then goes from there to hire artists to do the art for the game, to hire graphic designers, to do the design of the components themselves that are going to be in the game. What shape are they going to be? What color are they going to be? Uh, are they going to be plastic, wood, dice, et cetera? Um, put all that together and then send it to a rules editor who will look at the actual rules for the game and, um, and edit them to make sure that they make sense and that they are clear. Then we do more play testing after that. Once all the art, graphic design, rules editing is done, we play test that kind of version of it to make sure that the art and the graphic design is clear, that the rules are clear. Then you might do professional prototyping, which is kind of printing out, paying a, 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 a fancier, more pro professional printer to create a couple versions of the game in near final kind of components, what it's really gonna look like. Then when you have that, you do more play testing, making sure that all of that makes sense uh, to the play testers. You do revisions to all of the above, the art, the graphic design, the rules, that iterative process kind of starts again. And then eventually, maybe a publisher might crowdfund it, put it on crowdfunding, or if they have the money to just kind of print and manufacture it directly, they'll do that. And we're gonna talk about that in the next slide. So kind of, where I come in, the designer part, is just kind of the beginning, and then all of this is happening before it gets to the point where it can be an actual product that's sold. Okay, so now we've got like one copy of this game, right? We've got like a, a manufacturer that's printed basically a prototype copy of the game with all the final art, all the final rules, but that's just one copy. How do we actually get it mass produced? and uh, get it to our table. So, manufacturing, right? We've got to mass produce this, make thousands of copies of it. Most of the manufacturing of modern hobby board games that happens, happens either in China or in uh, Europe right now. Um, it's because that's where the expertise is, right? Um, in the United States, we go to college and university for things like law and medicine and architecture. In China, they go to university for things like color matching and uh, industrial printing. Uh, and so the, the expertise is there for making modern board games, uh, and that's why most of the games these days are made there. Um, so then we've got thousands of copies of this that are manufactured. Now it's got to get shipped across the ocean, brought to uh, a fulfillment and distribution warehouse, right, where these are going to be housed, where uh, retail stores like Red Raccoon can then go to the fulfillment center that has games from hundreds of publishers, thousands of copies of each one collected uh, at their fulfillment center, uh, and Red Raccoon will say, hey, this game looks pretty good, I want to buy a few copies of this, and they'll buy the copies from the uh, fulfillment uh, or distribution center that will then ship them to the game store in Red Raccoon, where fine folks like yourselves can walk in and, uh, and purchase the game and actually bring it home and put it on your table. So this is kind of the journey that a game takes from conception, the initial design, all the way through uh, being something that you can purchase and play. It's funny because when I bought a game store, I didn't realize how much of international business and stuff was going to affect my life. Because right after I bought my store, the Port of Los Angeles went on strike. So nothing was getting offloaded off of any ships. And then, you know, and there was just constant delays because there was, you know, ships just sitting out in the water waiting to be unloaded. We finally got that resolved, and then two weeks later the Teamsters went on strike. So now it made it to the ground and no trucks were moving the haul away. 
and then and then everything got better for a few years. Then we had COVID, and we had all the shipping issues during COVID. We had manufacturing issues where you know because parts of China were shut down. We had shipping issues where the boats were had to be quarantined when they arrived. And it's just over the years how much I've had to learn about this process right here. It was not something I ever even remotely had considered would be such a dominant part of my life of where things are, what's going on, what are the what are the drawbacks, can we rely on products showing up on time, communicating with customers to say, you're being sitting on the water and off of Los Angeles and it's just sitting there and it'll be here when it gets here. I'm sorry, I have no control over a lot of this process. Oops. Never expected that. Yep. Definitely is a, is a global industry. All right, I think that's it. And we want to save time and open it up for questions. Uh, if you want to learn more about me, I have a website, uh, www.benrossett.games. Of course, uh, Red Raccoon Games has a website. Or just walk one block over into the store, Red Raccoon Games, and say hello. Let's back up for the questions, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um, if you're going to ask a question, you'll need to use the microphone. I think you had your hand up. Thank you. There are similarities between games, and you explained a lot of all the work that's being done. But how many types of games are there? How many types? The question is how many types of games are there? Is it more than three? Yes. <laughs> Define types of games. I think there's lots of ways to break that down, right? You can break that down by, um, into categories like board games or card games, like, like maybe Uno is a card game, something that is only a deck of cards, versus dice games. Uh, so you could break it down by the component type that is used in those games, uh, which there are several categories of. You could break it down by the types of mechanics that are used in those games, right? Uh, worker placement games, resource management games, social deduction games. Uh, you could break it down by the, the type of theme that's, uh, that is, uh, is used in the game. Uh, you could break it down probably in 10 other ways and, and categorize games in different ways. How, what the player count is of the game, how long the game takes to play. So, I would say yes. Jamie, what do you, what do you think? So here's an interesting number. This is uh, about a year ago. There's a website called BoardGameGeek, BoardGameGeek.com. And it is just a massive database of games, pictures and descriptions and when it was published and stuff like that. I don't think they have everything. But uh, on the BoardGameGeek website, about a year and a half ago, I was really kind of, uh, my nerdy brain was like, how many games are in this database? And it was 189,000 different board games that were listed there. That doesn't even account the stuff that people just never bother putting in there. Publish yourself list. Sometimes users say, I got this game, it's not in here, let's add it into the list. Um, but you know, there's 189,000 games in there going back as far as, I think the oldest one I saw was 1958. I was going to bring an example today. I have a, a football game that was published in Bloomington in 1958. Um, and it, it says it was published like 13 in Apple Place, right? Which is uh, over off of, uh, right off of Route 9, kind of back in there by the Ewing Manor and stuff. We used to have a paper route over there a long time ago. Um, and uh, I was, I, I hung on to it, but I couldn't find it. It's somewhere in the store and I couldn't find it, but I was just, you know, just another throwback to Bloomington history. Yeah, thanks for your question. So you mentioned uh, that there's 3,000 games, about 3,000 games made a year. So when you're going through the process of creating a new game, how do you know that it's not something that's already been done, and how do you make something original? <laughs> uh, one way that you could go to a database like boardgamegeek.com, right, and try to search on the mechanics you're thinking of using, or search on the uh, the theme, right, and see if there's something else with the same kind of title or thing that you're doing. Um, 
but there's going to be overlap. There's always going to be overlap. There's nothing that is 100% unique. Every single game builds on something that came before it. Uh, and so the goal is not to make something that's 100% unique. Uh, the game is, the goal is to give a somewhat unique experience uh, to, to players that they haven't had before, right? And uh, give them a new experience. Um, you know, there's what, how many romance novels that come out every year? Is every one of, you know, they have some overlap, they have some kind of tropes and themes that are taught, you know, kind of happen in all those novels, but there's some difference between them, enough that they can exist as different products, and it's very similar for board games as well. Are there mechanics that you personally um, kind of default to when you're designing games? Or like, is first in flight, could you maybe walk us through the mechanics that we would expect if we were playing that game? Yeah, sure. Uh, so when I'm designing a game, right, I, I don't do the world building, the like games about zombies, right? I do like systems modeling, the games about historical events. And so um, right away I have a frame of reference for like what was this thing actually about? And so there are certain mechanics that might just kind of make sense for that. Uh, and so I try to match what makes sense in the gameplay to the theme of what you're actually doing in the game and the story that's being told. Uh, for First in Flight, it actually uses a deck building mechanic. A deck building mechanic means um, you start with your own personal deck of cards, but it's a very small deck of cards, and it's very simple cards, very standard. Everyone has the same kind of copies. And then through the gameplay, you acquire new, more powerful cards into your personal deck, and your deck becomes different than somebody else's deck. And then you use your deck to do something. Uh, and in First in Flight, you are using your deck to represent the actual plane that you are building. And so when you fly, you shuffle up your deck face down, and you flip over cards one at a time to represent you taking off and going along on this flight. And every so often, a problem will show up, right? Uh, something that you didn't expect to happen, which models what happened with the Wright brothers and early aviators when they were going up. Well, we think this is going to work, but I don't really know what's going to happen. Nobody's ever done this before. And so that kind of gaining new information and that uncertain kind of reveal of new events um, tries to model what it might have been like to actually fly a plane when nobody else had flown a plane before. Um, so, so First in Flight is a deck building game. Yeah. Um, do you usually start with making the mechanics of the game first or, the, or starting with, uh, with, like personally, do you start with making the mechanics of the game first or do you start with a theme or other or, or other games that you just like and then mixing them together? Or what, what kind of things do you do to get, get um, like, the, like the best ideas for games? Me, personally, I start with the theme, not with the mechanics, uh, because that's how my brain works, right? I get an idea about, oh, it might be fun to make a game about the Wright brothers, or I have a game about search for plan called the Search for Planet X, which is looking for a new planet in our solar system, which is a real thing that's going on right now in astronomy, right? Astronomers are looking for a new planet that they think might be out there. So it's the theme, right, that always hits me first and gets me hooked, 
and then I come up with the mechanics of how the game's gonna play that support that theme. But other designers would give you the exact opposite answer and say that they have a mechanics idea first and then they find a theme that's gonna work with their idea. Both are totally legitimate ways to do it. I personally think it's easier the way that my brain works to just start with the theme and build the mechanics from there. All right, we're gonna take uh, maybe two or three more and we're gonna start over here and then I've got one on the other side of the room. Yeah, I was just thinking about the uh, idea of the sort of simplicity to complexity uh, spectrum with the idea being, you know, that simplicity is attractive because you can get new people in fast. Complexity is also attractive because it promotes, you know, kind of replayability and stickiness and all those sorts of things. I don't know if you can just share any thoughts about how you try to hit the sweet spot on that. <clears throat> Uh, I think you're exactly right, and there are games for different audiences and for different situations. And so I think something that's uh, really, uh, really important, I'll put a plug in for my friend Morgan, who's sitting right behind you that owns Jovial Graphics here in town that develops board games. And I'm sure that he asks his clients, what is your intent here? Who is your audience? Who do you want this game to be for? and how do you want it to land with that audience? And so kind of identifying who might be playing this game, what kind of games those people like, that might lead you toward, is this a simpler game that's just a 15 minute card game that's gonna be, that you can buy for your eight year old nephew or that you can buy for your aunt at Christmas that doesn't really play a lot of games but maybe she'll get into this because it's pretty simple rules or is this for your hardcore gamer that really loves historical war games and is willing to sit down for three hours and play a simulated war game, right? So figuring out who your audience is will lead you toward that question of how complex should the game be. Yeah, I'll tell you that at the store, games that last under an hour um, that are kind of more that casual side will outsell by five to one over a game like Weather Machine, right? Weather Machine is like six games inside of one other game and it takes four and a half hours to play one round of it. And, and, and I know my friends won't play Weather Machine with me. I'll play them with, I gotta go to up by other people because they're like, you know, you can play one game of that per day. They would rather say, let's play a faster game did something wrong, I can try it again differently in just a few minutes as opposed to you're committed for a day. You know, uh, was it uh, Arkham Horror with all the expansions on it, right? People famously would play for six to seven hours to get through one game of it, and I can't do that anymore. <laughs> I, can't, I can't sit still that long. Thank you for the plug, Ben. Yes, that's absolutely something that we talk to clients about. Um, where that sweet spot is that you described is different from audience to audience. Um, the question that I wanted to ask, given that you two are kind of plugged into things that are up and coming in the industry, so Ben, you have a thumb on game manufacturing, Jamie, you have a thumb on like the retail system coming up. What do you think is next for the industry? What do you think is the kind of next big wave that's going to move over what people are playing, how they're playing it. That's all, that's all you, Jamie. That's all you. <laughs> um, I, think, I, like, I think we've seen a lot more going towards that casual market, right? Because COVID, I hate to say this, but COVID was really good for the industry, right? People were stuck at home. They couldn't go out, football practice, basketball, cheerleading, gymnastics, everything was canceled everywhere. Um, people spent the whole day stuck on Zoom, staring at a screen nonstop, and by the time they got to the end of the day, they were like, I am done with technology. And so we sold more jigsaw puzzles uh, during COVID than that one year that we had in probably the entire nine years I've owned the store. Um, and board games took off, and a lot of people rediscovered board games that, you know, um, it's not monopoly anymore, right? That's why everybody's picture of these angry fights and tables getting flipped with monopoly and everything. And there's so many more options now. So um, I, I think that we're, we've seen far more casual games coming out, coming into the market because there's a lot more casual players that want that one hour experience and not committing a whole day in there. So we're seeing more games that are like 
40 dollars and under, 45 minutes to an hour of play. That's far more games coming out. We're seeing a lot less of Twilight and Fury on the Weather Machine and Kanban and things like that. They're three hour plays. Those aren't coming out as, as, as much anymore. Um, crowdfunding has, I don't know if we're, Ben and I were talking about that um, Kickstarter just reported that their 2023 sales for board games were 20% down from 2022, which were 17% down from 2021. So maybe some of that bubble broke because with, with crowdfunding with Kickstarter or GameFounder back kit, we saw a ton of, of super heavy minis games, right? Where every box had 75 gorgeously designed unique minis that sometimes made a difference in the gameplay and sometimes they didn't. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes there were minis just for minis sake in those boxes. And I think we're gonna see a lot less of those heavy mini games and more of the, the rise of kind of the casual game market as well. Um, I'm hoping that we slow down on roller rights a little bit because there are so many of them that are out right now. You know, um, and, and, and we've also seen a lot more going back towards card games as well. A lot more card heavy games are coming out. Which again, that, you know, games are very generational. Um, my grandparents only played cards, that's all they played. My parents, most of it was nothing but euchre nonstop, right? Um, but occasionally they played board games with kids. I'm a Gen Xer, and, and Gen X was nothing but board games, Blue Scrabble, all those classics growing up. Um, you know, now we're, I think we're moving back towards some more card games as well, because they lend towards that casual experience. That, that's my opinion. Okay, we're coming up on time. We're going to have one here, and then, um, yeah, one in the back as well. We got time for you as well. So I was more curious about when you give the game to a publisher, how much input do you have after you give them that prototype? Do you give it to them and then as they go through the play testing, you get it back and they have a complete different set of rules or how much input do you have during that? Good question. I like to have definitely input in the process. Uh, it's helpful to be collaborative, right? It's helpful after I've been working on something for a year to get a different perspective. So I want them to take it and play it and give me their thoughts and feedback, and oftentimes make really good ideas for improving the game that I never would have thought of. But then bringing it back to me and having me kind of review those changes and having me give some input on the art style, the graphic design, right? I don't make those final decisions, but I think having a collaborative process ends up with the best product in the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we finish, I'll also say that if anybody here is a game designer, or wants to be a game designer, you can come on uh, Tuesday nights, the fourth Tuesday of the month, fourth Tuesday of the month. Um, the local design group here meets at Red Raccoon in the basement there where we play test our games. Uh, and so if you just want to come and play test new games, even if you're not a designer and you want to play some games of mine and Morgan's and other people's that are in creation, come, um, we do it at six o'clock? Six o'clock, fourth Tuesday of the month, at Red Raccoon, and you can also bring your own games as well um, for playtesting. And Ben wasn't kidding, a lot of the prototypes that I see are literally a piece of paper glued to a chunk of cardboard cut off box. And that's okay, because, because those pieces may never actually make the final game, right? They might be like, this was a stupid idea, we're gonna get rid of these, we're gonna bring this in instead. So, you know, never be afraid, because um, you've got to perfect the idea before you can take the next step. Thank you, Ben and Jamie. <laughs> Who knew that there was this secret universe hovering around Bloomington Normal of gaming? It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, right? Right. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you folks, too, for taking time out of your day. This is uh, probably the biggest crowd we've had yet to date. So that being said, uh, we're going to invite you to come back next month and enjoy, uh, enjoy another program with Greg Coos uh, in honor of uh, St. Patrick's Day. And he'll be talking about greening the prairie in uh, Irish settlement. So with that, go out and get some games. Thanks, Jeff. Awesome. Thanks. You did a great job hosting. Thanks for hosting. <laughs>